The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. We continue to talk about the physical appearance of Jesus. Now, the famous Jewish general Josephus mentions Jesus in his Antiquities, Antiquities of the Jews, book 18, chapter 3, but he does not describe him. However, he is what Josephus said about Jesus. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and of the Gentiles. He was Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Well, that is the testimony of Jesus, and so much for those who say Jesus was an invention, and so much for those who think Jesus was rejected by all the Jews of his day and time. I cannot help but wonder what Josephus would think about the tribe of Christians today. Well, there is another record that mentions the appearance of Christ, and this purportedly comes from the records of Caesar's court, which are now held in Vatican Library. And one of these reports is presented as being the report of Pontius Pilate to Caesar, in which he describes Jesus as being fairer than the dark, swarthy Jews who surrounded him. Now, that Jesus looked a little different from the standard Jews of his time is not surprising if his father was not a Jew. Now, other than this comment about being fairer, there is no more detail. It appears that people in the time of Jesus were, were less taken with the appearance of men than with other aspects of their person. Describing appearances does not seem to have been a big issue with them. And besides that, Jesus is described in the Bible as being the Word made flesh, not excelling beauty and majesty made flesh. Scripture is clear that men marveled at what Jesus said, not how he looked. Now, in his work on Jesus, Dean Frederick Farrar described him as a man of middle size and about 30 years of age, on whose faith the purity and charm of youth are mingled with the thoughtfulness and dignity of manhood. Legend says his hair was the color of wine, parted in the middle of the forehead and flowing down over his neck. His features are paler and of a more Hellenic type than the weather bronze and olive tinted faces of the hardy fishermen who were his apostles. Now his features were obviously marred by sorrow and his glance seemed to read the secrets of the heart. His eyes had often looked through tears and yet his face has an expression of divine calm. The dress of Jesus was not soft raiment. He does not wear the white ephod of a Levite or the sweeping robes of a scribe. There are no phylacteries or small leather cubes containing a piece of scripture parchment on his arm like the Pharisees. But there was at the corner of his dress the fringe of blue ribbon which, was, which the law required but it was not the ostentatious size worn by those who wanted to put on a religious show. Jesus is in the ordinary dress of his time and country. Now, he is not bareheaded as painters usually represent him because to move bareheaded under the Syrian sun is not practical. But a white scarf uh, is still worn to this day and it covered his head and was fastened by a fillet around the top of the head and fell back over the neck and shoulders. A large blue clean outer robe of simplest materials 
covers his entire person and shows occasional glimpses of a seamless woolen tunic of the ordinary striped texture so common in the East and it was confined by a girdle around the waist. It clothed him from the neck almost down to the sandal feet. But the simple garments don't conceal the kingliness of the man, yet there is nothing in his bearing that reminds us of the self-conscious haughtiness of the rabbi. His is a natural nobleness and grace which instantly suffices to check every rude tongue. And such was the physical appearance of the man Jesus as Dean Farrar presents him. Yet we still have no sense of his physical appearance, but we do have a sense of the spirit of his presence, and that is the sense that we need to have. Well, this is as much as we can say about the physical appearance of Jesus. Now, I would like to ask a question. What were the features or characteristics of his life here on earth? Well, first, his life was a life of austerity and simplicity. Some of the old messianic prophecies had indicated his voluntary submission to a humble lot. He was born in a cavern stable and cradled in a manger. His mother offered for her purification the doves, which were the offering given by the poor. The flight into Egypt was probably accompanied by many hardships and a return to life as a boy in despised Nazareth, followed by growth into the role of a rough carpenter as the son of a carpenter. He became a poor wandering teacher, possessing nothing and traveling the land. His Sermon on the Mount began with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, and he made the preaching of the gospel to the poor the chief sign of the opening dispensation. And it seems a fit comment on his poverty that after a life a little over three years of ministry, he was sold by one of his own disciples for 30 shekels, which was the price of the meanest slave. He never possessed a roof he could call his own, and the humble home at Nazareth was shared with several brothers and sisters. And even the house in Capernaum, which he often visited, was not his own possession, but was lent to him by one of his disciples. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. Well, Jesus never owned one square foot of the earth that he came to save. And we don't read that any of the beggars so common in the East asked him for alms, 
since he had apparently nothing to give. He looked like someone who had nothing to give. His food was the plainest and as simple as that of the humblest peasant. Bread of the coarsest quality, fish caught in the lake and broiled in the embers on the shore, and sometimes a piece of wild honeycomb. So there was absolutely no basis on which his critics could call him a wine-bibber and a glutton. Yet Jesus was not a pauper, and Jesus did not for one moment countenance the life of a beggar or say one word that could be perverted into a recommendation of the degrading squalor some teachers have seen as the perfection of piety. Jesus never received alms. He and his little company of followers lived on the produce of their own industry and even had a bag or a cash box of their own both for their own use and their charities to others. And from this they provided the simplest necessities of the Paschal Feast and distributed what they could to the poor. When the collectors of the trivial sum demanded from the poorest for the, ser the service of the temple came to Peter for the didrachma, neither he nor the master had that sum at hand. The Son of Man had no earthly possessions, but the clothes he wore. Well, secondly, his life was a life of work and prayer. Jesus worked from boyhood upwards in the shop of a carpenter to aid in maintaining himself and his family by honest labor. Jesus worked afterwards to save the world. He went about doing good, which was the epitome of his public life and constitutes his greatest originality. Ever active benevolence was crowded into the hours of the day, and at any moment, he was at the service of any call, whether from an inquirer or a sufferer, teaching, preaching, traveling, doing works of mercy, bearing with the stips, necked and the impatient and the ignorant, and enduring without a murmur the selfish pressure of the multitude in toil that absorbed all his energies. And more than once, we are told, there were so many coming and going that he didn't have the leisure even to eat. He only seemed to claim rest in the quiet hours of the night when he retired often to pray amid the mountain solitudes he loved so well. Jesus' resort for refreshment was prayer. And the disciples observed how much Jesus prayed and asked him to teach them to pray. Prayer was the source of strength for Jesus and the Psalms speak of this in Psalm 109 and verse 4, quote, For my love, they are my adversary, but I give myself to prayer. Now we recognize that Jesus prayed at key moments in his life and ministry. He prayed after his baptism in the Mount of Temptation. He prayed before he chose the twelve disciples, gave the Sermon on the Mount. He prayed for those the Lord had given him at the Last Supper. He prayed in Gethsemane before the crucifixion. He prayed on the cross at Calvary. That was his prayer life. Now third, his was a life that knew joy and sorrow. Among Jesus' many toils, trials and sorrows, only sickness was absent. We hear of him healing the multitudes, but we never hear that he himself was sick. Nonetheless, he suffered with those he saw suffer. He felt their pain and anxiety. His divine sympathy made those sufferings his own. We read that when a woman touched him with an infirmity, he felt virtue go out of himself. He was touched with compassion for the multitude at sunset in Capernaum. He entered into the sorrow of Martha and Mary at the death of Lazarus. But in addition to the sufferings of others, Jesus knew internal suffering himself. He knew the sorrow of being rejected by those he came to save. He knew the sorrow of having the iniquities of the world laid upon him. He knew the sorrow of being forsaken by the Father upon the cross. But Jesus also knew great joy, and he knew the joy of an existence devoted to the service of God 
and the love of men. Now, it is interesting that we are never told that Jesus laughed, but we are told that he wept, and we are told that he sighed, and more than once that he was troubled. Yet, Jesus had an inner happiness which shone on his countenance, and we read that Jesus on one occasion rejoiced in spirit or exalted in spirit when the 70 returned from their victorious mission to proclaim the kingdom. And this is when Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Well, such was the inner life and the outer life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, the sequence of events we are now about to consider are nearly the same in the first three Gospels. Once again, it is necessary to recognize that the Gospels were written from different perspectives of the meaning of Christ. And we also need to recognize that the scene of the Synoptic Gospels was in the Galilee, while the scene of John's Gospel is in Judea and Jerusalem. Now, the Gospels do not agree point by point. And if they did, we would recognize collusion. The fact they do not exactly agree or present the same incidents in the same order is a proof of authenticity. Well, again, we will follow the chronological guidance of Luke while not neglecting the other evangelists. As Dean Farrar noted, the order of Matthew and Mark seem to be guided by subjective considerations while events in the Gospels are sometimes grouped by their moral or religious bearings. And Luke gives more consideration to the natural sequence, although he sometimes allows a unity of subject matter to overrule the order of time. So that is a synopsis of the Gospels. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, simply call us at 1-800-501-2851. Well, immediately after the ministry activities we have previously considered, Jesus saw himself surrounded by a great multitude out of every city. And we learn from Matthew and Mark that this was the first time he taught by parables, and he did so to the multitude who lined the shore while Jesus sat in his favorite pulpit, which was a boat kept for him on the lake. Now, depending on your spiritual history and church exposure, you may have been used to a pulpit placed center stage, so to speak. And this probably goes back to the practice of the Jews 
during the exile when the Jews kept their sacred scroll, scrolls in a box. Now in more orthodox and ancient churches, the word may be proclaimed from a platform level pulpit facing you on the right, and they call that the epistle sign, and an elevated pupil on the pulpit on the left called the gospel sign, as well as seeing the gospel itself read in the center aisle of the church. Further, it is interesting to note that the lectern is also called a podium, and that comes from the same source as the word podiatrist and indicates the speaker is standing at it. Now, by contrast, Jesus sat to preach on many occasions or taught the disciples as they walked along, often using the surroundings as an illustrative base for what he had to say. Now, to refresh our memory, a parable is a succinct, didactic story in prose or verse which illustrates one or more instructive lessons or principles. It differs from a fable in that fables employ animals, plants, inanimate objects, and forces of nature, and use them as characters, whereas parables have human characters. And a parable is a type of analogy. And the point is that people can get the picture from a story when they can't get it from prose. The parable form of teaching was not new. Jews were familiar with what is called the mashal and with the method of instruction which begins with the question, quote, what is the thing like? But the spirit of Christ's parables was unique and unparalleled, nothing approaching its depth and power, its brevity and manifold applications can be found in the Old Testament or from all the literature of mankind before or since his life on earth. And it is possible, based on Mark, that this teaching was given on the afternoon of the day in which he healed the paralytic. What we can see is that this new form of teaching was felt to be necessary because of the state of mind which had been produced in some of his listeners in the multitude. The one emphatic word, hearken, with which he prefaced his addresses, prepared them for something unusual and memorable in what he was about to say. Well, the great mass of his hearers must have by now been aware of the general features of the new gospel that Jesus preached. In addition to hearing some self-examination, some careful thought and reflection of their own was necessary if they wanted to profit by his words. Take heed how you hear, was the lesson he would now impress. And anyone who has done much preaching, and more especially much teaching, knows that audiences and congregations are checking what is being said against what they know, believe, or have been taught. Now, it's been observed in secular circles that when someone is speaking, many of the listeners are preparing a response based on what they think. And most audiences want the speaker to reinforce what they themselves believe. And while they may not physically stop up their ears, as the Jews often did, or assault the speaker, they're doing it in their hearts. Now, Jesus warned his lesson, le listeners against the attention of curiosity and what my own father used to call curiosity seekers. Jesus would warn them against mere intellectual interest, which is what Paul encountered among the Athenians. Jesus spoke to fix their minds on a sense of their moral responsibilities for the effects produced by what they heard. And Jesus taught them in such a fashion that the extent of each hearer's profit would depend largely on his own faithfulness. Now, parables have a double purpose, to illustrate and cause to sink in and to teach and conceal. To show them that the only true fruit of good teaching is holiness of life and that there were many dangers which might prevent its growth, Jesus told them his first parable, the parable of the sower. Now, personally, I like the way Ma Matthew presents the parables because he puts them all together in Matthew 13, 
rather than, than taking them in the time order in which they were given, and that breaks them up and separates them. However, since we are following Luke, let's consider Luke's account in Luke 8, 4 through 15. Quote, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it, and some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bear fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And that really means there's more to what you heard than you heard. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, those by the wayside are those that hear, then comes the devil and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the riches and pleasures of this life. Some of the best remembered scenes from Christ's life involve the healing of lepers. Yet for most today, that dreaded disease is dismissed as something from history. Yet in India, world missionary evangelism is still reaching out to minister to lepers, deemed untouchables by those around them. Our doctors, nurses, and ministers embrace lepers as Christ did. Through our clinics, we treat the disease one patient at a time. And through our witness and ministry, we treat their souls one person at a time. We provide them with food, clothing, medical care, and love. We bring value and healing to those whose life once had no value. The evangelism and world missionary evangelism is not just a part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and the heart of our work. And nowhere is this more apparent than in our work with letters.